I'm uh, centenier Mike Hayden, uh, and I've been asked to chair this evening. The candidates have uh, drawn lots about where they're going to sit. So uh, that's, uh, we'll start with the first candidate over here giving their speech. They will speak for three minutes, uh, after which they will hear the bell. Uh, well, with 15 seconds to go, they'll hear a bell and then be asked to stop on three minutes. After they, each candidate has spoken, we will have uh, an opportunity for questions and the candidates will have one minute uh, to answer the questions. Uh, I would ask you to, uh, if you've got a question, that you keep your question uh, fairly brief uh, and to the point, make the question clear, it gives the candidates and everybody else the best opportunity to hear the answers. So, uh, so that's the point there. Uh, and finally, I'd like to say that um, uh, Hugh Raymond ha offers his apologies because he's unwell in, and is unable to attend. Okay, so uh, the, the microphone will be passed along so that the candidates will be able to, uh, uh, to speak loudly and clearly and uh, you will all be able to hear properly. So we start, uh, the first candidate is uh, Kirsten Morell. This is going to be interesting as the night progresses. <laughs> anyway, good evening, everybody, and thank you so, so much for coming here this evening. It's a bright, sunny evening, and there are many other places you may wish to be than here, but thank you so much for listening to us. I'm Kirsten Morell, and I've been deputy in St. Lawrence for four years. It's been an incredible privilege to be a deputy here in St. Lawrence, to represent you, to listen to you, to speak to you, and try to get those messages across. Can you not hear me? Because I prefer not to hold the mic if possible. I, I prefer not to hold the mic if possible. Um, no. Sorry. No, so... It just won't be recorded. Um, thank you. So, as I was saying, it's been a real privilege to represent you here in St. Lawrence for the last four years. During that time, I have tried to be someone who stands up for the islanders, who challenges government, who believes in transparency and accountability, and so who asks the questions that matter. And that was one of the reasons why I stood four years ago, was too often I heard politicians and often the media not asking the questions that really, really mattered. And I wanted to change that. And I hope over the past four years, you've seen that I have been trying to change that. And indeed, now we have a system where questions are regularly being answered. During the four years, I've been both a scrutiny chair and an assistant minister. I've been, uh, had the, pri the privilege of representing the farming community. I've spoken out about the need to support farming in Jersey, not just because it's economically important, which it is, but also because of food security, also because farming is our very landscape. If we lose farming, if the fields are no longer farmed, they will be built on. Jersey's landscape, Jersey's history and heritage are based in farming, and I've been incredibly lucky to represent farmers over the past, over the past year. I've also worked in culture, arts, and heritage. I've been developing careers for young people. Why? Because I am convinced that Jersey is at a crossroads. We need young people to see their future in this island. If they don't, then the island and our community that we know has no future. The cost of living is incredibly high. I have proposals that help us deal with the cost of living in my manifesto. I, young islanders, I know, are looking at their future here and saying, I can't afford to live here. One way, as well as helping with the cost of housing with shared equity schemes, but one way we can convince them to stay here is to have interesting career paths that they see and they think about, no, I can be in the media and in Jersey. I can be in the arts and in Jersey. Jersey is more than just the finance industry. The finance industry itself is something that we desperately need. It keeps us in the standard of living. It provides us with the health care and the services that we need. But there is more to Jersey than just that. And if we can teach islanders the skills, young islanders the skills, to have their careers here in Jersey, then I believe Jersey has a strong future. At the moment, this crossroads, you have a choice. 
a choice to look at the future or a choice just to stay in the past. I believe I represent the future and I hope you do too. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Gregory Guidal, and uh, I'm extremely proud to have been able to serve the island at a high level for the past four years. And for that, I have to thank you, or at least most of you, for having voted for me four years ago. It was not all a gift, uh, because it was four years of extremely hard work. I participated in two ministries and 20 committees, panels, and boards. It was a lot of work. I hope that I brought a small but significant difference to the people of Jersey during that time. For the last year, you may know that uh, I had to defend Jersey against the nation of my birth. And um, I hope I chose my camp carefully. <laughs> this government started all the generational projects that hadn't been done previously. It was quite a gamble to think that uh, we would get all these things started that take 10, 15 years to achieve. Um, and of course, when you don't get to be the person cutting the ribbon in front of the TV. Uh, we started the um, sports and community centers uh, renewal. And that's a 10 years project. Uh, but eventually, it will see all of sports and community infrastructure renewed in Jersey. That was quite important. We started Fort Regent. That's something that absolutely needed to be done, hadn't been touched for decades, and it's now started. It is something that will happen. It will take 10 years. Uh, so none of us here is going to be on the front page of the JEP opening it, but somebody needed to start it. We worked on the state's pension, um, on the financing of the state's pension. This is something, again, that nobody knows about, uh, but Jersey had two 200 million pounds debts that were extremely expensive uh, to service. One of them, and this is mind-boggling, um, was running for 100 years at 5.6%. That's mad. So we looked at that, and we made it 30 years at 2.5%, two, two uh, which is very, very different. In fact, we're talking about billions of pounds of difference. Somebody needed to do that. That didn't make the front page of the JEP. And uh, the government officers is a good one as well. Um, that project was mooted 12 years ago. And the reason for that is that, remarkably, the government of Jersey rents most of its offices. With all of the real estate it owns, it actually historically rented most of its offices. That's 10 million pounds a year. And it took 12 years before we actually started doing something about it. We did this while dealing with the two worst crises of the post war era, COVID and Brexit. At the same time as we were doing the island plan, the climate emergency, OneGov, and our hospital. I think we did well, considering the circumstances, but there is much to left, left to be done, and I hope you'll allow me to do it. Thank you. Okay, we're all going to have fun with this microphone tonight, I think. Is that any better at the back? Okay, thanks. Good evening, everyone. I'm John LaFondre, and it was 16 and a half years ago that I was first elected, and it has been an absolute privilege to serve as deputy for St. Lawrence, as senator, and most recently as chief minister. The last few years have been unprecedented with Brexit, with COVID, and now the impact of Ukraine, and it's taken calm, tough decision-making, ex resilience, experience, and total commitment to lead the government through this time. And while some people sadly suffered loss and others still face difficulties, Jersey has emerged in a strong position. And with thousands of hours spent dealing with the pandemic for two and a quarter years, it was inevitable that work would slow on other projects. But recently, certain people have tried to claim we've been a disaster. Well, we protected lives, protected businesses and livelihoods, kept the schools open longer than almost anywhere else. We had a fantastic vaccination program and a hugely successful spend local scheme which attracted international attention. 
we have come out of the worst global pandemic that certainly we've ever seen in my lifetime in a sound financial condition with a surplus last year of 59 million pounds and higher reserves. If all of that is a disaster, then I wear that label with pride. I have no time for nasty, petty politics. I try to be positive, constructive, and to secure a positive future for Jersey. And I've been encouraged and humbled by the wide range of people who thank me personally for our work throughout COVID. And I'm seeking re-election to continue to drive forward work or already started in other areas. We have saved over 200 million pounds that is now being used to improve areas that had not been supported for years. And there have been too many short-term knee-jerk decisions in the past. So we've implemented many long-term decisions, which will, over time, see sustainable improvements in health, education, sport, culture, and the arts. We've increased investment into mental health by £10 million a year. There has been improvement, but we need to focus even more on access to support, delivery, and outcomes. Plans and progress will deliver thousands of homes over the next few years. There is hope but it requires continued focus and persistence. Work has started on Fort Regent, and the new tech fund will help grow the digital economy. And to finally get planning permission for our new hospital is significant. It is a large sum of money, but it is funded responsibly, it is affordable, it is ready to go, and it does need to happen. We live in a complex and rapidly changing world. It will take experienced politicians to grapple with these challenges present Jersey on a global scale, whilst at the same time protecting a strong parish community spirit. And I hope you will recognize the value of my experience and consider me for one of your four votes. Thank you for listening. Good evening. I'm Hilary Jern, and I would love the opportunity to work for you to make Jersey a fairer, more inclusive, and sustainable place to live. If elected, I will use my passion, experience, and influence to make a real difference. Making a difference is what drives me, and it's why I'm standing as an independent candidate. I grew up in Zion and became interested in politics through my family, who taught me about the importance of giving back to our community, of making an impact and difference for good, of getting things done and strong work ethics, and how to participate in a good debate that is respectful of everyone's opinions especially the importance of listening. This inspired me to follow the path I have been on for the last 20 years, working with and influencing international organizations and their member governments, including the United Nations, the World Bank, and the European Union. I've worked for Oxfam and the Fair Trade Network, and now through my own business, encourage countries to reduce inequality, protect the environment, and create a sustainable future. I have monitored, scrutinized, and influenced the European Union's budget, how the World Bank spends its funds, as well as influenced trade, climate change, agriculture, and international development policies. Giving my time locally, I'm Deputy Chair of Jersey's Young Adults Homeless Charity, JAF, an advisor to the Jersey Community Foundation, elected member of St John's Committee Rural, and editor of St John's Parish Magazine. Using this experience and knowledge while working collaboratively and building consensus, I believe I can make an impact. Policies must be values-led, evidence-based, and focused on our future for our younger generation. We must address and improve the situation for housing in both the private and rental markets to stem the cost of living crisis. I want to see a strong, diverse economy that works for all, which supports small businesses, innovation, and pushes us to be a sustainable finance jurisdiction. As a mum of two, I know firsthand how vital it is that we devise and implement an education framework that focuses on problem-solving, critical thinking, building confidence and empathy, and reducing excessive testing. Protecting our environment is high on my agenda. We must do more to protect our island and play a role in achieving global goals. This includes accessing affordable, healthy food from farmers that are valued. I will prioritize delivering accessible primary healthcare in a new hospital, and I will work for a diverse and inclusive society that addresses the gender pay gap, supports parents' return to work, and further adoption of the living wage. I want to support and preserve parish life as it enhances our community. Though I'm unhappy with this new arrangement, I will strive to ensure the constituency's four deputies and three constables work together to establish a space for constructive, collaborative exchange of ideas. I promise to listen to you and to be your voice. I am accessible, approachable, constructive, 
and I will collaborate with all state members to develop impactful policies and get things done. Please consider voting for me to help deliver a fresh approach to politics that builds on experience and passion. Thank you. Hello everyone, and especially the parishioners of St. Lawrence. Thank you so much for coming out this evening, and thank you to for Mike Hayden for being our chair. My name is Andy Howell, and I'm standing as an independent candidate for deputy for the new District 3, and I would really appreciate your vote on the 22nd of June. I feel very fortunate to have lived in Jersey for the last 40 years. I know that doesn't mean I qualify as a local, but nevertheless, I regard Jersey as my home. We've brought up our family here. I really care about Jersey and all aspects of island life. People, environment, traditions. I'm standing for election because I think we need a fresh start. We need new states members and I would love to be one of them. I want to be part of a states assembly that listens to islanders and is open, transparent and accountable. I will work collaboratively and with integrity to make sensible and financially sound decisions, ensuring that we do not waste taxpayers' money and that we live within our means. I want to address the cost of housing. As a retired dentist and wife of a GP, I'm passionate about making positive change within our healthcare system, reducing bureaucracy. Our future hospital needs to be properly future-proofed and provide all the services and facilities that we need. Current plans need to be revisited. Sadly, morale is really low at the moment. And I want that to change. Our wonderful frontline staff need to be cherished and empowered to do their jobs. Excellent patient care, coupled with kindness and compassion, has to be the number one priority. I believe everyone matters. I'm approachable, hardworking, and will value your input. I think together, we can put islanders at the heart of decision-making. But the only way I can make a difference is if I get elected on the 22nd of June. So if you live in St John, St Lawrence or Trinity, please vote for me, Andy Howell. I would love to be your deputy. Thank you so much. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for coming here this evening. I think there might even have been more of you, but the meeting was not very well advertised, and when I was going around today, there were lots of people that didn't even know it was on, so I apologise for that. My name is Mary Venturini, and I'm one of the new independent candidates standing in Trinity, St John, and St Lawrence. My roots go back to St. John's when my grandmother, my widowed grandmother, came there, went there, came there in the, in the 1920s with two small children. I came back to live in St. John's about 20 years ago. Before that, I established and ran the largest English language publishing company in Rome when I lived there with my husband, bringing up a young family. I know about doing business in a very competitive and difficult environment. I see that there are numerous urgent problems in this island which now need some sort of solution. I'm really concerned about the whole healthcare system, which is on the verge of breakdown. Patients, nurses and doctors are suffering hardship and stress. Why isn't some of that over £800 million earmarked for the new hospital going to them? They tell you that the new hospital is world class. They even tell you, as they have this evening, that it is ready to go. It is neither of those things. It will have fewer beds than the present hospital and many missing departments. And what about the so-called Jersey care model? A model of muddle and inefficiency so far that we must sort out. 
Housing is also in crisis, and this is affecting recruitment of staff in all sectors, healthcare, teaching, hospitality, retail, farming, and even finance. The lack of accommodation is hitting the young with families worst of all. We urgently need accurate information about the housing crisis. I would like to go on next to the climate emergency, one of the forgotten subjects in this election, or it is not talked about enough, and it must be put back on the agenda. With less archaic planning regulations and new incentive, incentives for renewable energy, we need better public transport, and we need it fast. I was here on Sunday visiting the church, which I haven't seen for a long time. There were two tourists outside. They wanted to get to St. Brillard's. They could not get a taxi, and they could not get a bus. Now, that must change, not just for the environment, but also for the hospitality industry. I think communications are extremely important, and the trust must be re-established between the government and the voters and people must have confidence that their vote really counts. Thank you for coming here this evening. I have the advantage of being closer to the microphone. <laughs> uh, good evening. My, my name's Elaine Miller, and I'm standing as an independent candidate. I've been really enjoying getting to know St Lawrence and getting out to meet some of you to discuss your concerns. It's very good to see so many of you here tonight, so thank you for coming. I'm an advocate and I've been a lawyer for 35 years. I've worked hard to achieve some degree of success in my career. I was a director at one of our biggest banks and a partner of one of our biggest law firms. For the last seven years, I was the Viscount and the first woman to hold that office. My manifesto focuses on three areas. First, business. Although we have to protect the financial services industry, the majority of businesses in Jersey employ fewer than five people. Small business is the lifeblood of every community and we must do more to support them by minimising burdensome red tape. In St Lawrence, of course, we have the war tunnels and Hampton, which are key historic and cultural sites, but also contribute to our important visitor economy. We must help them to thrive. We should also enable new and innovative businesses to establish to help provide new and exciting careers for our young people. Second, health and social care. Our health professionals should have the resources and facilities they need to provide a high standard of health and social care. If the new care model is to work, it needs funding and people and more input from the health professionals at this stage. And we must now focus on building a new hospital that meets the island's needs. Third, but by no means least, housing. Clearly, there is work to be done, and many of you have told me of your concerns with housing and its impact on your families. We need to look for sensible ways to increase our housing stock. We need a fair deal for landlords and tenants, and we need help to buy schemes that work for Jersey. But we must understand current and future demands for housing, and to do that, we need a properly considered strategy and population. Like many of you, I also want to see effective controls and more transparency in government spending. As Viscount, I had responsibility for public funds and I took that responsibility very seriously and monitored costs carefully. I was always under budget. But I found that government systems do not result in value for money and that has to change. There must be clear responsibility for public spending and individuals must be held to account for management of budgets, much as we see in the private sector. My previous roles have helped me develop skills that are essential for a states member. I can make sense of complex information, I can find solutions to problems, and I know how to make sensible and fair decisions. And that's what I'm offering you now, someone who's capable, who can get things done, and will work hard to deliver positive and effective outcomes for the three parishes and the island as a whole. I believe I can make a real and immediate contribution to the States Assembly. I do hope you will give me one of your votes. I will not let you down. Thank you. So thank you to the candidates for their uh, clear introductions. 
Uh, it's now time for questions and your opportunity to put them on the spot. Um, my colleague at the back here will bring the microphone around so you can speak into it. Uh, when you've got that opportunity, please start by giving your name nice and clearly. Uh, keep your questions focused. If you've got a bit of an introduction you want to talk about, keep it brief and to the point. Remembering the candidates only have one minute to answer, so we'll get a better result if your questions are clear and, uh, and precise. Um, the other point I'd like to make is just make sure that your questions are general and not directed to any one or two candidates in particular. All candidates should have the opportunity to give an answer. So, who, should, who would like to start? The lady over here. Uh, and the first question will be an answered in turn, starting with Kirsten. Get elect Ooh. If, you, if you get elected, will you still, would you advocate outside consultants or will you try and make sure we have in-house consultants? Because I think the amount of money that's been wasted, um, I don't think that's right. So I'd like to know your opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Faye. Um, it's a really good question and it's one that I try to address one of the first things I did when I was elected four years ago, um, shortly after being elected, I had a successful proposition passed by the Assembly which forced the government to report on its use of consultants because there's no question it seemed like millions and millions of pounds was just going out principally outside the island in the use of consultants. There are often good reasons in terms of specialist skills, particularly you think about engineering, things like this, where you will have to bring in people from outside the island, and I appreciate that. That's absolutely correct. But for me, you always need to look at Jersey first. And so I also brought a proposition, successfully adopted by the states, about putting Jersey businesses first. And this was about trying to get the government to buy services and goods from Jersey businesses. So unfortunately, the amount used by con on, spent on consultants has increased by two to three times over the last four years. So I think we continue to look at it. And try and get, when we are using consultants, make sure they're Jersey consultants wherever possible. I'll stick to that and I'll continue that. My turn. Uh, th this is a very interesting question because I entered the States um, hoping to do exactly that. And what I discovered is that actually um, we need to re-empower our civil servants. What's happened is that we, we hire very, very capable people and then we make sure that if they make anything that looks remotely like a decision, we're on their back for the next five years. That's not right. Uh, they are completely capable of, doing the, of writing the reports, they are completely capable of helping us make decisions, and they should do that and not have to farm this out to the UK, which they do now every time because it's so simple, so much safer. So we need to re-empower them to make their own decisions. Yes, I can carry on with that. Um, much of the rise we've had, sorry, in the last. Is that okay? Okay, sorry. Can we start the clock again? Much of the rise we've had in the in consultants, certainly in the last three or four years, has been things like the hospital project or the IT systems. In other words, where you need uh, significant capacity and you need it happening quite swiftly. Um, but actually, I think Gregory is absolutely right in terms of the culture within the organisation has been. Uh, there's a lot of people who are quite battered and bruised. In other words, if a mistake is made, uh, the media, the social media, politicians can be very, very vicious. And that is where sometimes consultants and professional advice is sometimes used. Part of that is about changing the organisational culture. It's about growing your own, all those type of things. There are measures in place to do that. Um, and, uh, but it's taking time. You're trying to change an oil tanker in terms of culture. Um, and um, uh, as I said, we are changing things. We're doing everything from trying to bring more women to the organization in terms of at the senior levels, uh, uh, getting the skills in the right place, all those type of stuff. That is about increasing capacity within the organization to do the work we need to do. 
Thanks, Faye, for your question. I think absolutely there needs to be more of a balance needed. Um, definitely looking f first in Jersey is really important. A lot of the time, some of those um, jobs aren't advertised. They go straight to, to those consultants without ha having that focus on, and seeing if they're in Jersey there is first. So I, th I think that's really important, but also not to be just UK focused. You know, we are our own uh, island and we can also benefit from going out further and being able to um, find consultants with other ideas than just UK. Um, so I think that's really important. But I have to say, you know, I, I've been uh, used by the government of Jersey as a consultant myself. So I am an example of a Jersey person being used um, around the ratification of the Paris Agreement um, and negotiation with Bayes in the UK to get, to get that done. And also supporting the government when they went to COP26 um, in Glasgow this this, uh, this year or last, last year, it's gone very quickly. Um, so there is incidents, incidents where it actually w it happens, and it does, and I've benefited from that, but I really think there does need to be a balance and to look further than just the UK if there needs to be ex external consultants. Thank you. Hello, I think occasionally we do need to have specialist consultants from elsewhere but over the last four years, we seem to have had so many consultants who have come in they, from outside. We, they have ignored local Jersey folk. Often, I think, the adverts haven't even been locally. I know of one instance where someone was very high up, was given his job um, because he was advertised to be um, a, an English paper, and then after he'd signed the contract, he, uh, they then advertised it for local candidates. And I don't think that's right. And I think we should definitely use our local talent and train up our locals and give them a chance and show them they can go up the, property, the ladder. Thank you. Um, I think the knee-jerk reaction in Jersey at the moment is reach for English consultants and they have all the answers. I'm very interested to hear that the, uh, the most of the consultants have been used on the hospital project and IT. Those are two of the worst examples of things going wrong that I can think of. And if this is what the UK consultants have done, well, I'm sorry about that. I know that there are lots of very good UK consultants and we do need outside talent occasionally. But those two, digital and the hospital, are the worst examples that I can think of. Like everyone else, I do think there is a place for consultants. Um, I've also been a consultant for the government some years ago. I drafted the dormant bank accounts legislation, which meant banks were able to release funds to, to be used in charitable causes. I know that by instructing me to do that, the government saved, it cost the government a lot less than it would have done had they gone to a Jersey law firm. I also know, sadly, that instructing an, an English barrister can be a huge amount cheaper than instructing a Jersey law firm. So do you want value for money or do you want Jersey people involved? So there's always a, dis there is always a decision to be made about who is the best person for the job and how do you get best value for money? I agree we should use local people as much as we can. What I really care about is that when we do bring in consultants, we control their costs. There's not enough attention paid to how consultants spend their time. And I have seen clear examples of consultants just racking up time costs without proper consideration and doing things which are inefficient and could be done in a much better way. And that's what needs to stop. Thank you. Thank you. My name, my name is Richard Day. Um, I have been here to the other hustings as well, so they, they, I'd probably be a nuisance. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask a similar question, but in a different vein. Um, and also, just a very basic, very quick aside, um, we, we, we are told we have accrued so many millions in reserve, and um, I asked the question, why are we having charities with food banks on the other end? Um, I, I can't understand it. It confuses me. But um, my question um, is, any, will any standing member who wishes to receive my willing vote Will you here today fully agree to change this divisive and divisive and debil debil I can't say it myself. <laughs> De 
debilitating system of government around to a more open and inclusive system and well with it, um, uh, and bring about a, um, a referendum for the public, a public referendum. And will you try to, will you try to, will you do this in your first year of office if you want my vote? Um, do you agree it seriously needs to change? That's the other part of the question. Okay. Yes, um, I am, I apologize, but I don't quite understand the question. <coughs> you want us to change the system of government for a more open and inclusive system. And I did ask this, and many of you agreed that the ministerial government needs reassessing and looking at. Many of you did on this panel, but the previous meetings I've been to. None of you have actually stood up now and said that needs looking at, and I honestly feel we need a referendum to change it. I, I've followed politics for years, and I never wanted ministerial government, and I don't think it's done us any good since. So I, I honestly want to, you, you to consider bringing a referendum about for the people of this Jersey, of Jersey to have a vote and think about changing. Thank you. Uh, s thank you. That is much, much more precise. But I'm still surprised because I've heard myself and many of the other people here actually mention the ministerial government uh, with a bit of disdain. Uh, what it has done for Jersey, it's an, it's, it can be efficient, but what it has done for Jersey is divide the assembly into government and opposition. So when we have 49 people who should all be going the same way to make Jersey work, we have 20 people trying to do something and 29 people trying to stop them, uh, which is completely ridiculous. Um, I wouldn't mind giving a good look at um, committees again. And that's something that we would, um, that we would very, very probably look at in, uh, in the next term. I can say I've looked at various times uh, at the systems of government. Um, the issue is that we have, as Gregory's saying, 28 people who, in theory, are going to be critical friends. Uh, actually, in reality, it turns out to be 14 or 15 who are on scrutiny, and at times it varies into opposition, uh, which is not constructive. Um, and so um, uh, the question we all have is that the risk we end up talking about ourselves yet again and actually, uh, whilst we've had a pandemic uh, in the last two and a quarter years, we have an awful lot of challenges that are coming coming through. So I have no problem. Uh, I have tried. Uh, we had uh, uh, policy development boards which we put in place which would try and give, I don't like the expression, backbenchers to have a bit more of a say in how things were happening. The system actually came in uh, just before I was elected. Uh, and um, and uh, as you say, there are benefits to the committee system. Will it cope with what we do these days? That's the question. No problem looking at it. Thank you, Richard, for your question. I've just found my notes from the last time you asked that question. So um, really, I think the main thing is to, to say that I agree, there's, it's divisive at the moment. It really does split the assembly in two, makes for opposition. What I worry about now with the added layer of political parties, it will make it even more divisive as well. And we're such a small island that we do need to work together with so many, you know, hearing on the doorsteps, hearing at other hustings that we've been at and the questions we've asked. We've got so many issues to overcome. We can't have this opposition. And, you know, we can't have this divisiveness. So I think it's really clear that that does have to be look at, looked at if the ministerial um, way does cause that divisiveness and be able to use the others in the assembly as effectively as possible. Of course, it also relates to the quality of the ministers. So I think that will be really important as something I would ask a potential chief minister in the future, how they would choose those, uh, their ministers to work with them as well. Thank you. Hello. I absolutely agree, Richard, that it has been not right for Jersey, this ministerial government system. Power has been concentrated in the hands of a very few number of people. In the pandemic, just these very few number made the decisions, and many of the other members of the states did not have a say, and they had to ask questions. They, hadn't, they were not involved in the decision-making. Even the um, person who was in charge of education was not having allowed to have a say. And that was not right, because our children were very badly affected. And her opinion should have been considered. I have, um, have also been part of a group that went, and I think we need 
I went to see the scrutiny panel and we discussed that the machinery of government was not working and that has, at the end of four years, has eventually come to the House. Thank you. I'll pass you. Uh, it clear, the system, the present system, clearly isn't working and nobody likes it. Um, as I go around the, um, the, the, the houses and the hustings, it's the one thing that people are always talking about. I would just say two things. One is that I think, uh, rather than going back to island-wide senators, we could go forwards to island-wide deputies. Uh, but retaining the constables as a very important part of our system, I think they are absolutely vital. But what I hadn't heard in your questions in the past was the business about a referendum. Now, referenda are blunt instruments, and it's either yes or no, and it wouldn't actually solve this problem. This is a problem that we've got to have in consultation and wide consultation, not just within the government, but within the whole island. With that, I would agree, but not a referendum, yes or no. Um, Richard, I think when this question came up before I, I answered yes, that I was in favour of some form of review of ministerial government. Since then, I have actually spoken to a couple of people about this, and what I've been um, told was that before ministerial government was introduced in 2003, people hated the committee system. It was moribund, decisions didn't happen, there were delays, it wasn't, people didn't feel the committee system was working well, and that's why we moved to ministerial government, and that ministerial government was, in 2003, intended to evolve. What it was intended to evolve into, I'm not sure, but it clearly hasn't evolved, and it certainly to the extent it has, it hasn't evolved the way we want. So I think we do need to do that. I think there are concerns about, is it giving civil servants too much power? I don't know, but I do, my note here was, I, I agree with, with, with Mary that a referendum to the public about machinery of government would be a very, very difficult thing to establish into a blunt yes or no answer, so I wouldn't support a referendum, but certainly consultation. The ministerial system is divisive, there's no question, I've seen that. It wastes talent. There are 49 people in the Assembly, 28 of them are completely left out of decision making. That's a waste of talent. Unfortunately, the Council of Ministers too often is formed not because of talent, but because of loyalty. That has meant we have had weak ministers in the Council of Ministers over the past few years. That is a waste of talent and it's a waste of the votes that you give people. I would like to see the ministerial system changed. We do need to bring back a form, an element of the committee. Because as one minister said to me, she was there faced with four or five civil servants on her own. She could not argue with them because she was just outgunned. When it, had she had four or five assistant ministers with her, she would have been, it would have been a much more equal playing field. So there's no question. But one thing, some people have spoken about power. We are not here to have power. We're here to make life better for you. That's what matters. And that's what I want to achieve. And I do think that changing this ministerial system will help us do that. Thank you. My name is Paul Votier, and I run a business. It's education. You've talked about education. And I feel that um, the, the young youth of our generation are not being taught other trades. All it seems to be is finance and going to college, and that is it. Now, I got a, there's a thousand vacancies in this island at the moment, and I've rung up Highlands, and they don't even do certain courses in my trade. And I know that these people can earn as much money they can do in finance now. So I feel that the school should be teaching the trades, promoting trades at the same time as they trade uh, proceed with um, these other educations as well. I just feel stonemasonry, carpentry, just not pushed enough in the younger generation. And I know they can earn, because I'm paying their wages, they can earn as much as they can in finance as well. So I do feel education really has to start looking at other trades than finance. Uh, 
Well, you have the former education minister sitting three rows behind you, Mr. Votier. But um, the point I was going to say is that she was passionate about skills. And I can't give you the details on the Highlands uh, courses, but I do agree. In Yeah, no, what I was going to say, is I, yeah, I, no, don't worry. I do agree, though, from the point of view that there will be people, there are some people who are uh, absolutely, um, if you like, their DNA is to go away, degree, university, and all the rest of it, and there are others who have a more practical vocational thing, and we need all of them. And my understanding was that we've, uh, we have put a lot of extra funding into education and into the skills side, particularly with the view of trying to do things. And even within the states, uh, or the government rather, uh, we have done various things like bringing back apprenticeships and trying to improve that, uh, bring that level up. That's all part, again, of what we've been saying about dealing with the organization and trying to change where we were five, 10 years ago and where we're trying to bring it into, because I do agree entirely with what you're saying. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for your question. I, I think it's absolutely um, important that we do um, invest more, especially in higher education that really focuses on, in on skills because we need to, as everyone says, grow our own. Um, and we are having a huge um, uh, uh, crisis at the moment where we have huge gaps in vacancies. Um, and I think we really do need to look at our education system and really try to focus in on the key areas that we need to, to grow our own on. And in my manifesto, I also have clearly that I think we need an independent skills and careers agency really goes into schools at different levels to encourage uh, uh, youngsters to see that there are a number of really interesting, exciting careers that can ha be had in Jersey, that it's not just the finance industry. Often you hear that the certain industries can go into schools and really advertise, you know, give nice uh, pens, etc., uh, a way to really get them on board. And I think we really need to have this independent skills agency to get in there and to be able to show them and show them the pathway of building skills and where they can go to find those skills as well. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I think um, Tony Blair did a disservice to the whole of the UK, really, because he thought that 50% of people should go to university. And while that's a good thing to go to university for some people, for lots of others, they've got talents in other spheres. And I think perhaps you need to, we need, you need, would need to liaise with Highlands and see if you, there could be someone who could train up stonemasons. And... So, so perhaps we need to um, get, uh, look get our, ch our youngsters earlier because it's a, an amazing trade, and we've got the most. I don't know how they build those granite walls everywhere, be, but we there are lots of other trades. We need plumbers and electricians, and I think we need more at Highlands for our young people to do because we we're desperate for the trades at the moment. Thank you. I would like to ask a question back. Would you train me? I'd love to do that. Uh, really, seriously. I was um, up at uh, Roselle the other day, and I was talking to a, a scaffolder. Um, he's got a small business, and um, he said to me, well, what's the future of Jersey? So I said, mm, I'm a bit worried. And he said, so am I. Uh, he used to have nine sites, and he's only got three at the moment, but I won't go into that story. But when I said to him, well could I come and help you? And he said, well, it's very interesting. He said, quite a lot of women are applying to me now. And I think that is important because women don't think that they can be plumbers or electricians or carpenters or scaffolders. And I really think there's a whole generation out there that if you could appeal to women, it would be fantastic. And yeah, I would like to come and work for you tomorrow. Um, I'm also going to say I entirely support education for skills and, and the trades. We clearly have a shortage. I have been told previously about a young person who wanted to be a stonemason and the states wouldn't support an apprenticeship. I think it's beyond. Education clearly is a big part of it. So where we can provide training in Highlands, for example, um, I think we should be doing that. And I think where people are willing to take on apprentices, we need to look at apprenticeship schemes that enable and help employers to take on young people at um, living wage. So to encourage, because you are still, the sad fact is, you are still competing with finance. 
Um, when I went to school, um, we had, this was in the uh, 70s, boys learnt woodwork and metalwork and girls learned cooking and sewing. I don't necessarily advocate that gender divide, but I certainly advocate that level of practical education in all schools. Thank you, Paul. I said at the beginning the importance of careers and having different career trajectories for kids because that's one way we'll keep young people here in the island. So skills training is vital. There's no question. This morning, I already had a discussion with somebody about apprenticeships, the way we don't do apprenticeships in, in the way that they do in Germany still. Apprenticeships are still valued in Germany. I don't know why. And this comes again to this idea, let's stop always looking to the UK. They started killing off apprenticeships. We followed. We got to turn that around. In my manifesto, I talk about lifelong learning accounts for skills because we're all going to have much longer working careers. The government, no matter what it does, the government cannot fund that. So we need to have money going in, and I say we fund this by a little bit, half a percent of the social security contributions we make that gives us the power to then go and buy the courses and the apprenticeship courses, etc., that we want to do. Because I may be a stonemason tomorrow, but I was in finance yesterday. That's the way our career trajectories are going to go. They're going to be many different careers through our lives. Our working lives are going to be 40 to 50 years, if not a bit longer. So I'm dealing with that in my manifesto. It's so important. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I couldn't agree more. I mean, uh, I felt that there was something going on when my electrician started charging more than my lawyer. Uh, and it's definitely, it's definitely something that we, that we need to work on. Uh, in fact, it is the essence of our population strategy we know that closing the borders is not going to do it. What we need to do is grow our own. So it is the essence of our population strategy. It's, a, it's the essence of keeping Jersey the way it is. Thank you very much. Um, my name's Tina Palmer. And I'm going to carry on with the skills. I did have a housing question, but being as well on skills, I think I'd stay on that. Um, I think that the island needs to invest in Highlands College. Highlands College was taken out of the island plan for whatever reason, but the hospital had 800 million spent on it when a lot of that money could have actually gone into Highlands College because the hospital's going to need stonemasons, plasterers. It's going to need office staff. It's going to need doctors and nurses. So what we need is a strategy that goes along with skills and a new hospital. It takes three years to train as anything, an accountant, anything, three years. So saying like we're going to put a strategy together, we need those three years. And in three years, where are we going to be then? Even more shorter staff than we are now. So we need a proper, sustainable skills strategy that's fit for purpose. Apologise, I'm so busy ranting, <laughs> forgot the question. So what, is your, what would you do, what would your first steps be to try and put the island plan, in the island plan, Highlands College? I mean, it's, it's falling down, it's underfunded, and I know that there's been people before trying to get funding for it, but, but it's, it's, not, it's not even safe in places. So if we can't, if we're going to train our people, we need a suitable site to do that. And it hasn't got the state-of-the-art um, equipment that it needs either. So how are you going to do that? Thank you, Tina. I know that Highlands College uh, yeah, really needs a lot of investment. Um, I've had emails um, about this already from concerned constituents. Um, it's really, um, it's quite shocking to see that we have an education system that seems to, you know, stop largely at 16 um, and then channels, you know, into basically, you know, only a few schools that carry on on the A-levels and then the rest it would be to Highlands, but yet Highlands, as you have said, is underfunded, and also the building itself is falling down. So I absolutely um, would be behind 100% within the next government plan, and also when we would be negotiating uh, the budget, um, to look to make sure that that is part of the wider education strategy and to really look, look at the, the importance of that. Because then, as we said before, you know, growing our own is really important. It is part of the population policy to make sure that we have a stable population policy. So we do need to make sure that we you know, provide the right skills and build the right talent that we need for Jersey. Um, thank you. Hi, Luke. Tina, thank you. Um, I, we, I think several of us may have had emails from your colleagues um, 
because I think everyone who's working at Highlands is concerned about the state of the buildings. I mean, I think the most important thing is the staff, and we've got to really look after them. And before we, before you could make a strategy, you'd have to. I think you'd have to engage and listen, go and listen and talk to them and see what the problems really are because I'm sure you're aware of them but I would, I'm not aware of all the shortcomings at the moment so that would be the first thing to find out what the problems are and then to be able to go forward after that but we really do need the, uh, the young people to receive the training and the learning and it's not just young, it's throughout life and so we can all use the, the college and carry on and start looking after Ireland and look, you know, it's for the good of Jersey. Thank you. Um, Highlands, another building that is falling down. How many states' buildings are falling down or have been ma badly maintained? The hospital is a prime example, another prime example. Uh, to get back to skills, I think that it, the skills are absolutely essential, as you will have realised from my, my previous um, answer. I think it could be quite sensible to sit down and have an economic, a, a four-year economic plan to which you fix the number of workers and skilled and unskilled that you need in this island. You would then have an idea of how many you can recruit and train within the island and how many you can get from outside. At the moment, it seems to me that this is just done up in the air somehow. There is no planning, and I think this is very important for a small island. We must have some sort of economic plan to know where we're going. I also agree. I think Highlands has been struggling with underinvestment for some years. I used to know a wee bit about Highlands, and for example, the IT department for many years occupied porta cabins, which meant to be temporary for a year or 18 months, and they were in it for five or six years. Um, I think actually they were quite happy because it kept them out of the way, but it's not really what we want for our young people. They were doing excellent degrees, which people, uh, the students were coming out in conjunction with industry, 100% employment with the IT degree. There were lots of very good partnerships giving people degrees. And I know we're moving back, I'm moving back into the subject of degrees rather than the trades that we talked about earlier. But Highlands really needs the focus in terms of giving our young people the skills they need. I think it also has to feed into, as I mentioned earlier, our population strategy. We need to look at what we want to be as an island, what skills we need, and make sure that we're either growing those skills ourselves or that we are bringing people in to perform those jobs on a planned and contained way. Thank you. Government needs to invest in people the people of Jersey. And for 20 years, government has not properly invested in the people of Jersey. We've seen this in the education system. There hasn't been su sufficient investment in education. We've seen this in skills, and we've seen this in buildings. Now, credit, where credit's due, there has been some investment in buildings over the past few years. That's really important. But still, we are not seeing enough investment in people in this island. This is why people of Jersey don't feel like the government represents them, because it feels like the government isn't very interested in the people of Jersey. That has to change, and that's what I'm trying to do. That's the work I've been trying to do, whether it's through careers, whether it's through trying to bring in these lifelong learning accounts which empower the people of Jersey to take control of their own destinies, to choose their own careers and their own learning. Highlands is vital, and you're absolutely right, Tina. Highlands is an embarrassment in terms of the fabric of the buildings. How can you learn? We, well, all the evidence shows us inspiring places inspire great learning. Highlands as a building is no longer an inspiring place, so it has to be invested in, and the government has to start investing in the people of Jersey. Thank you. Um, in the last couple of years, we've ex experimented with something completely new in Jersey called a master plan. Basically, the idea is that we have this immense puzzle of sites and things that we need to do. We need primary schools, we need secondary schools, we need the fire and ambulance station, we need a university, we need highlands, and the problem is just putting all of, this, all of this together. And we've been working actually quite hard on it. And I can give you a little secret now. The nice site, the nicest site for highlands, for the next highlands, is Gloucester Street, the hospital site. We put the hospital in Overdale, and we have in the center of town 
a 50,000 square meters site that can be our university, that can be our learning center. And that's the plan. And that's, that's one of the possibilities. So, Tina, I agree absolutely with you in terms of the state of Highlands. It's appalling. And the reason I was referring to this thing, there is a four-year plan, by the way. It is a four-year look ahead. It's called the government plan. And in theory, uh, it gets elect voted on every year. It moves forward a year, and it should mean that there are no nasty surprises, as we did have before this government, uh, when uh, financial projections change rather significantly, but the expenditure didn't. Uh, anyway, legacy issues is what we've been talking about. Uh, and in this plan, you will find there are £17 million allocated starting in 2023 for a new Highlands campus. One suggestion is what Gregory has suggested, the attractions. I saw uh, somebody looking very unhappy. But that would actually mean you get regeneration in Helia. It's easier for businesses to access. Uh, and actually, it would reduce your transport impact on that area. It's an idea. It'll have to go to consultation. And I can guarantee there'll be a 1,000 different opinions, which will mean it won't happen for 10 years. But it does need to happen. It is a legacy issue. It's exactly the same as the IT and the hospital and the buildings and all that sort of stuff, which we have started to address. Thank you. Uh, it's uh, now 8 o'clock, which was the uh, official time limit, unless, unless the candidates want to continue. 9 o'clock. They told me 8 o'clock before, I'm sure. We've got another hour. So you're saying another half hour. Candidates over here say another half hour. We'll see how it goes then. Uh, okay, we've got a question over here. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm John Stuart Jones. Uh, I've been in the island for 36 years. And um, I'd just like to say thank you first. You may be a bit surprised by saying, saying, somebody saying thank you to you for those who put themselves forward to a job I I've thought about, but I thought, I don't know if I could do that, so <laughs> thank you. Um, and uh, your willingness to serve the island. Um, some of you will know that I've had uh, been in complete opposition to the assisted suicide and euthanasia law, and I've written to you and so on, and the proposed law. Uh, but in that context, firstly, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions linked. Firstly, are you aware of the position statement of the Jersey Hospice Care that the European Association of Palliative Care has declared that provision of euthanasia and assisted dying shall not be included in the practice of uh, palliative care, and the position has remained for, unchanged for 50 years, and this is the position of Jersey Hospice Care. And that's one question, because I, I think a lot of people do not realize that. Secondly, there will always be a need for ongoing improvements in care, especially with our aging population in Jersey. And what support would you be willing to provide in all areas of palliative care, not only through the hospital service, and especially in the hospital service, but also through the hospice, as well as nursing and residential homes, and others including family nursing and GP primary care. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I, this is a really, really difficult question. I um, s struggle. I think if I had um, motor neurone disease and I knew I wasn't going to be able to feed myself and I was not going to be able to move, I would perhaps think very hard for myself, but I would find it very, very hard to actually go ahead with assisted dying. I think we should have really, really good palliative care on this island. I don't think there has been enough investment in family nursing of late. The primary care is the worst area because they have raided the health insurance fund they have taken £58 million out of it just to plan a care model, not for our care. And that's not right. We, the the um, health insurance fund should be going towards half of our GP care and it should be going towards our prescriptions. And they ha there's no thought to what's, what's going to happen. They haven't thought it through, this government. And that's why I'm standing.
Uh, my feeling is with excellent palliative care right the way through the system, assisted dying would not uh, be necessary. Um, assisted dying, I feel, is a very, very personal thing, uh, and that it, if somebody wants that for the end of their life, then it has got to be absolutely strictly controlled legally. But it's not something that you can come to towards the end of your life, nor can your family come to it. Um, I've seen people who do want to die. I've seen people who don't want to die. And my opinion is very, very personal on this. I would not uh, like to see assisted dying in any particular case. And with palliative care, I think it can be controlled. Um, yes, this is a very difficult subject, and it has come up at, I think, every one of our hustings so far. Um, absolutely, we should have palliative care to the level that people want and need. Um, I think that's a given. Um, I think if we were to introduce assisted dying, which the, the state's assembly has agreed in principle to do, um, it needs to be carefully debated. Um, we need to have appropriate safeguards, and it has to be very much a matter of personal choice. Uh, there should be no question of either a doctor or a family member sort of saying, Granny wants to go now. Um, it, you know, it, it is entirely personal choice. I, I accept it's very difficult to get safeguards around it. Um, I think from my perspective, I would want to have that ability if I reached a stage where pain or the quality of life was just so much I didn't want to go ahead. Um, I think in other countries where they have it, um, ironically, the controversial cases have been where it's been young and relatively healthy people that have gone and sought assisted dying. There's been some very controversial cases in Belgium um, and also the families not being kept adequately informed. Thank you, John. Um, I'm really worried that the debate about assisted dying is also detracting from further investment in palliative care. I think that's a real concern that we're now kind of just turning away and saying, well, that's the route we go down. Uh, assisted dying is a debate that will come up at least twice because I brought a successful amendment to the proposition on assisted dying which said that we have to give it extra scrutiny to make sure the safeguards and processes are appropriate before we go any further. I will not vote for any assisted dying legislation that I do not believe stands the level of scrutiny that's required for this. But anything to do with assisted dying cannot detract from the importance of investing in palliative care. It's only perhaps 10 years ago that the scandal about, I believe it's a Liverpool care pathway it was called, where many of us ignore palliative care and what it is. And suddenly the whole of the British kind of nation suddenly realised that people were being given the most appalling treatment in the last few months and days of their lives. So this is something we need to focus on at the palliative level and discuss assisted dying separately because assisted dying needs to, needs to be carefully, carefully scrutinised. Thank you. I brought this uh, proposition to the Assembly to, in principle, allow assisted dying in, um, in Jersey. Uh, and we've already looked very, very carefully at the safeguards. Uh, those are going to be developed again and brought to the Assembly and then developed again, depending on the results in the assembly, and brought into law. I think the, the essence of this is that I do not feel that I can make that choice for someone else. I cannot tell someone else, this is one decision that is going to be taken away from you. If you want to make it, you should be free to do so. And that's my private position on this. The other, the other question is about well, we're, we are changing the care model in Jersey. And, uh, <laughs> well, I'm sure that uh, my colleague will continue on that. Day. Well, we'll see. Um, yes, the, um, I think I am aware of the position on Jersey Hobson's in relation to palliative care and the, the dynamics uh, and with the subject we're talking about. Um, as I understand matters, every 73 days, the medical knowledge doubles globally, which basically means that uh, the advice keeps changing, the knowledge keeps changing, the treatment keeps changing. Uh, the debate itself was the most respectful and powerful debate I've ever attended in my 16 and a half years. I think it illustrates the, some of the really difficult and complex subjects that actually states members do have to deal with. Um, and, um, and that's why, in my view, you want good and professional politicians in there. When I say professional, people who are capable of dealing with what is an incredibly emotional 
uh, issue. I think I've got 40 seconds left, 20 seconds hopefully left, hopefully. Um, what I was going to say is I spoke to elderly relatives. My position was that subject to the controls, I was supportive of that point. I keep an open mind. It is very much a case, though, at what point does the state have the right to take away uh, the ability of an individual to decide at one of the most difficult points of their life? That's the challenge. But taking all the point of all the ethical issues that you raise. Thank you. John, we've talked about this yesterday when I came to your door, and thank you very much for the information that you gave to me. I will absolutely read uh, it with, with detail. And that's what I will promise to you, is that we know, or I know, that this will come, debate will come back into the States. And I will then make sure that I will have done all the reading and talk to all the people that uh, are affected by this a, a, as deeply and respectfully as possible to ensure that the decisions I make on behalf of you um, ensures that that uh, you know, is as wide and respectful as possible. It is a very personal decision. So it's something that is really difficult at the moment as a lay person to say, this is where I would want to go. But what I think is really important is to learn from those who have already do it in Belgium and the Netherlands and learn from the mistakes and make sure we have the strongest safeguards possible. But the top, top thing is to make sure that we do enough funding for palliative care. And we know the hospice is underfunded. There are areas where they aren't getting the amount of money that they're needing, so they really are struggling in some areas. And that means we are not able to give that palliative care to those that really need it. And that is the most important at this moment that we make sure that happens. Thank you. I think we had another question over here. The gentleman there. Good evening. I'm Andy Besaw. I've traveled down from St. John's. So thank you for having us. Um, We've spoken a little bit about young people, about housing, education, and areas like that. And it's encouraging to see that there are some young people here today. Um, but what I'm curious about is when we come to polling day, there'll be very few young people that will turn out to vote uh, in statistics against the island's uh, demographics. So what are you as a government going to do to encourage young people to get involved in politics? Because once they're involved in politics, then they're also involved in shaping their own future rather than you making decisions for them. And as yet, I don't see that happen. So I'd like to know what you're going to do to engage young people into the island politics. Um, this was the, the, the idea that I had when I first started canvassing, that young people were not engaged. Um, and it was one of the reasons why I decided to stand, because I felt that, that, that young people were dis, disaffected from politics. Uh, I have been really pleasantly surprised as I have gone around to find that nobody, no young person has said to me, no, I'm not going to vote. Um, and I think this is absolutely excellent. Um, one of the really exciting things that happened to me was my grandson, who's only eight years old. He came uh, to me with a little flyer saying, vote for Mary. And at eight years old, I was surprised that a, a, a young person knew what voting was, but my goodness, he knew what voting for, was. And going around St. John's, I have not actually found somebody, a young person, who has been uh, who has said, I'm not going to vote. They've all been very keen to discuss it, and I've discussed it with them, and I've really been excited by the reaction that I've had. So I hope this is going to continue. Um, I think the few young people that I've met have obviously been studying very hard because they've not really been particularly interested in engaging because they're working for their exams. Um, I think we do need to do a lot more to encourage young people into politics. I think a lot of work is being done already by the state's GREF. They take uh, children, I'm not sure which years, they take them into the state's assembly regularly. Every class can go in. They have a debate. They have someone like the Attorney General or the Deputy Bailiff chairs those debates. The Youth Parliament is doing a huge amount of good work. And I think we also send young people to various international youth parliaments. Um, the youth service is having hustings. I think there's about four or five hustings. We have one tomorrow night. It'll be interesting to see what the turnout is there. Um, we have, there has been a few young people at the hustings, but I think we need more. I think we need more education and really starting it as an early age to, to engage children with politics and what it means for them, because they need to understand the implications for them of what voting means and the people who have power. Thank you. Um, it, Brexit, 
was against the interests of most young people in the UK, and yet most young people in the UK didn't come out to vote against it. And so that shows the, the depth of the problem. In Jersey, I think it's um, also kind of, the, it, it's a greater problem because many people don't see Jersey politics as being important to them. And so I think one of the first things you absolutely need to do is have in primary schools showing children very easily what voting is. Like, so you can have such practical lessons around if you take this, if you vote for this, then we'll be doing this tomorrow. If you vote for this, we'll be doing something else. And showing people how that changes their world. We also don't teach Jersey history properly in schools. We teach about the Battle of Jersey, we teach about Neanderthal Man, but we don't teach about the decisions since the Second World War that have changed our lives. What started the finance industry? Which decisions in the states of Jersey created our finance industry? So few people know this, and we're not teaching young people this about Jersey's own history. So that's what I would do to try and get them really engaged, is teach about Jersey and the power of voting. Thank you. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. A, a lot more needs to be done in schools. Um, what I've seen is from the outside, the, uh, the work of the graph with the Youth Assembly, uh, to which we have all participated, and um, that's absolutely fantastic to see young people actually um, play the role of elected members for a day, uh, and they do, they do it extremely well. They debate uh, respectfully. Um, they come to decisions, they vote. Uh, it, it's really, really nice to see. Um, and there's a rotation, so all classes have a chance to, um, to do it. And of course, um, we have the youth hostings. Um, and uh, it will be my first one tomorrow night, so I'm quite uh, eager to see who comes and what questions they ask. Yes, there's, quite a, uh, there's actually a lot of engagement so far. We, it's, as we all said, youth hustings tomorrow in Trinity. Um, it's year five. That, um, in fact, both my children have been through that process. It's fantastic. Uh, the youth assembly, uh, which I'll come back to in a sec, and the latest sort of initiative is the youth parliament, which is still, particularly with the pandemic, we're trying to see how that's going to evolve. That is meant to be a lot more engagement with youth in decision making, essentially, or how policies are developed. But um, the youth assembly, uh, myself as chief minister, I've had the pleasure of being put through the cosh uh, for questions without notice, but quite literally, um, I will say the quality that comes out of the youngsters that are quiz me on questions tends to be actually higher. Uh, and that's uh, then actually we get asked of by states members. Um, so a lot of it is actually about the young people I come across are engaged, but for me part of it about keeping their interest is about, I think, seeing that there are solutions to the problems that they, ha they see, and actually I think they're more interested in positivity of seeing change, not the negativity which sometimes we are getting uh, in certain quarters. I think the bigger thing needs to happen is that it's not just about every four years. I think it needs to be engagement right the way through and that the youngsters also see that they have a voice and an influence to the, current, the politicians as that happens. And you've seen that in certain thematic areas, youth are really engaged. We've had mental health areas, they've really engaged the skate part, the environment. Um, and gender pay gap, we had a letter from uh, Victoria College, for example, sent, sent to the state's uh, uh, assembly. So I think there are engagement, but it happens on a thematic area. And what that needs to happen is to sh youngsters need to show that they have an influence, that they can influence those sitting politicians, and that they can then also, that next step is to say that when they, you know, go, we go to the elections, that they also have a voice there. So I think it, it's about education, continuous education, and not just what's happening now ahead of the elections, but it really is a continuous education throughout the, the four years, um, you know, in, in between the elections as well. I think that's really important. Thank you. Yes, I agree with what other, everybody else has said. I think it's really important to engage our young people right from primary school. I think I've got my little grandson. I think they've got lots going on in their school council, and he takes it really seriously. And, that, and they are, you know, they're worrying about litter, and they, they, really, they have issues that, and the environment. He said, Granny, we've got, we've got to get a better... You've got to get a better car, Granny. You know, that yours isn't right. But I think we, we just need... There's a wonderful work going on with Lisa Mansell and the Youth Parliament. Um, but it's going to, they just, our young people need to have 
be engaged all the way through their lives. And I was really encouraged. I went to knock on a door yesterday and somebody said, my son's going to vote for the first time. We're going through all the manifestos. And I thought that was a really good thing that they were doing. Thank you. I think we have a question over here. Uh, my name is Keith Graham. Um, probably a, a simple question, and hopefully not been asked this before, um, is if elected uh, and you can only achieve one thing, what would that be during your term of office? And for our three sitting members, um, the same question, but perhaps you'd also comment on where have you, what have you failed to achieve during your last four years? Uh, one thing, where to start? I, I, I think really housing has to be right up there. It's, it's such a big impact on families, on individuals. Uh, young people are concerned about where they're going to live. Um, it's impacting on businesses. I mean, we've heard even, you know, we know it's a problem with, with um, recruitment in the hospital, um, in all sorts of industries, but even finance industry is now impacted by people coming here and not being able to find homes that suit them. Um, I think it's not just a case of, and it's a question of adequacy and suitability of homes. I was thinking about this today. When I left university, my first sole accommodation was a bedsit that I rented from a housing association for £50. And the word bedsit seems to drum up all sorts of awful ideals, but it was lovely, it was perfect. So we just need accommodation that suits young people, where they can start, where they can be independent, and then move up through the ladder into their one-bedroom flat, their, their family home, as they progress. But I think quality of accommodation, and it's for everybody as well, for seasonal workers, for people who are coming in to work in farming and hospitality, Housing just has to be something that we get right in the next term. Uh, can, I just, <laughs> can I just point out that we did say at the beginning that uh, the questions had to apply to all members, who, uh, all candidates rather, who could answer the question. So the second part of your question is probably unfair, really. So uh, first part. Sorry. Um, Housing is absolutely correct, but for me, um, I've been focused very much on the economy and the environment over the past four years, and helping islanders deal with the cost of living is something that I really want to get st stuck into and help. I think it's one of the biggest, housing comes into that, I think it's one of the biggest challenges we're going to have over the next four years. I believe inflation has sadly barely begun to get started, and it's something we're all going to need help with. We have an island which has become so successful, it's now too expensive for many, many people to live here. We all hear the stories of people leaving the island. We need to reverse this. And the best way we can do that is by making sure that people can afford to live here. I'm suggesting in here one of the fastest ways to deal with that, one of the best tools, is through the tax system. Government can put money back in the pockets of islanders by raising tax thresholds. It really needs to do that, and it needs to do it in this next government plan. But that's not all. We need to work across the board to keep prices down, and I want to be part of that challenge of solving those problems. Well, that's the most difficult question of the night. Um, before, before we came into Perda, I was working on about 200 files, so to choose one as the one thing that needs the most attention is going to be very, very difficult. Um, housing, definitely. Uh, but housing, we've launched the construction of 5,000 homes. Uh, so it will be difficult to follow on and uh, to guarantee that it will happen, but it's, it's launched. It's something that is on rails. Um, I would say healthcare. Healthcare is very important, but I'm also one of, the, one of the least qualified people to work on it. So probably the hospital. The hospital is the most expensive thing that Jersey will have done in its history. It's, co it's already cost us hundreds of millions of wasted money just because we've procrastinated and changed our mind every few years. It needs to be done. Yes, when I came into the drill I'm in at the moment, um, it was, uh, I think the expression we're using is a bit like buying a restaurant and finding out you haven't got a kitchen. And I really do not exaggerate. The number of legacy issues we inherited, which frankly were in a bit of a mess, is the understatement of the year. Um, 
uh, actually on day one, uh, two of us went into a meeting the CEO and told there was a 200 million pound lawsuit, which he'd just found out about. There was an 80 million pound one coming down the line. And basically because uh, somebody had sat on the damages law for two years or three years, uh, there was nothing we could do about it. We sorted that out January 19, it was in place. In the first six months, we've ordered 40 million pounds. The IT that we talked about, can you imagine if we'd not invested and didn't have the video conferencing facilities in 2019 that we invested in when February 2020 came through? But looking ahead, what we've not done well enough, we have advanced things because of COVID, we had delays, mental health, sorry, mental health, housing, and completing the population policy. There is one, there's been a lot of work done about it, but again, we've not had the information to be able to apply it properly. Hospital, absolutely, but we deal with a lot of complex jobs that we're trying to sort out. That's what we've been trying to do, and I'd like to finish a whole range of them in the next four years if I can. It's up to you. So we've been hearing that there is a lot of uh, work already out there. There's lots of strategies, there's lots of recommendations, but you know this is all just on paper unless we have actually some money behind it. So I think for me, something that's really important is to really make sure that we have a budget that is able to feed into the key areas, especially that um, that we're hearing of the crises that we are facing at this moment, because we need to make sure that they are adequately funded, whether it's health, whether it's education, whether it's supporting our farmers and ensuring we have a diversification of, econo of the economy. We can't just keep making recommendations and strategies, but not actually fund it. So I think that's my number one thing that I want to make sure, um, because without funding, then you know, they won't be able to be implemented. And again, in four years' time, we'll stand here and say you know, we can look forward, but we haven't done it yet. So that would be my thing. Thank you. My thing is that I want excellent patient care, coupled with kindness and compassion, to be the number one priority. I want our frontline staff to be really, really cherished and looked after. At the moment, they are not happy. And I want the... The, the hospital to be a happy place to work for everyone. And then I think that is what we really should do. And then we re should really care on all the people of Jersey and their, their care, because that has been failing miserably over the last four years, and we need it to improve. So I want to go forward positively and make a real difference and sort it out. Thank you. Um, I have two quite simple things that I would like to see. One is an excellent bus service all the way around the island, uh, and possibly part of it experimental with hydrogen buses. Um, I think this would help get us all out of our cars. The other thing that I would like, which not many of us have talked about, is an excellent arts festival. Uh, both music and um, the performing arts and uh, the visible arts. I think this encourages people right from their young ages, right up towards the end of their lives. We all know the, how important uh, art is in therapy and how important music is in therapy. And I think this would bring back some really exciting feeling to the island amongst all our difficulties. Okay, um, it's uh, coming up to half past eight. I think we've got time for another question at least. But I'm in your hands and in the hands of the candidates here. Um, sorry, uh, we've had two people who've asked. I saw somebody down here who, did you want to ask a question before? Yeah. Hi, is this on? Hi. Is it on? Can you hear me? Okay. So my, my name is Richard Urban, I'm from St. John. Thanks to the candidates that have bothered to come around and meet me at my house. So one of the things that Hillary mentioned earlier really resonates with me, and that's about not always focusing on the UK. So I'm from the UK, I spent 35 years there. Let me tell you, there's a lot of things wrong with the UK. And it, you know, there's reasons that I'm here. When I see that we keep importing UK ideas and people, it really makes me shudder. Um, in terms of 
the next term. What is it that the candidates here can bring in terms of looking for ideas from real world leaders? Because name me a thing that the UK is a world leader in right now. How about education? Certainly not. Why aren't we looking, for instance, to Estonia and what they do on a shoestring budget compared to what we have here? So the real question is, rather than always focusing on the UK, what can the candidates here do to really adopt best practice learning from around the world in the next four years, rather than going for the easy, but not necessarily the best option? Thank you. If you've heard any of my speeches, any of my politics over the past four years, I have constantly and consistently demanded that Government of Jersey does not just go straight to the UK for everything. And the reason is, is because the UK is good in some areas, but as you've quite rightly said, it is not good in other areas. Education is the perfect example. Finland, much better than the UK at education. Sweden, much better at the UK in education. When it comes to IT, we do need to be looking at areas like Estonia. When it comes to apprenticeships, I mentioned Germany. They know how to do apprenticeships in Germany. So for me, there's no question. If Jersey wants to, and we hear this word, Nate, word all the time, Jersey wants to be world class at things, then you have to go to the people who are world class. That means having an international outlook. I am completely behind that, and for the last four years, I have consistently said that. But I also want Jersey to understand that that international outlook needs to be brought home to Jersey. So we are then passing those skills and that training and that learning to islanders so that future generations, long after I'm gone, will benefit from that. Thank you. Well, that's, that's one person who actually doesn't come from the UK. Um, I completely agree with you, uh, absolutely. <laughs> um, I've, been, I've lived and worked all over the world, and I hope I can bring some of that experience uh, back home now. Um, and uh, if I'm re-elected, uh, I really, really want to uh, mend things with France. They've used the uh, fishing dispute to distance themselves from us for their own political purposes, and we absolutely need to mend our relations, and I, I really, really wish I can help with that. Yes, thanks. Um, absolutely agree, by the way. We do actually punch significantly above our weight in a whole range of things, whether it's financial services, uh, where the contributions we make globally is huge, um, whether it's... Um, we actually look through what we did during the pandemic. There are a whole range of things where actually people copied us. The one I'm, I'll particularly name is the spend local card, mainly because I was at least 50% involved in getting that as a, as a starting point. And actually, uh, we, can, we uh, take part in a variety of, um, of forums or fora, or whatever the plural is, of like the Assembly Parlementaire de la Francophonie, but also British Irish Council. I was the one who insisted on presenting it there, and actually Arlene Foster ran me up within a week, and they copied us. And actually, Czechoslovakia, the Czech Republic wanted to. I didn't have the data. Scottish Labour would have done if they ever got into power. So the point is, we do have the ability to look elsewhere. We can debate the best where we do, and during COVID, I think we started doing that. Uh, yes, vaccination program was, we were very dependent on the UK. They pulled a blinder on that. The border testing was something we created in conjunction with Microsoft. So I think there are uh, things there. Digital, we have got the fastest global, uh, sorry, the global fastest speeds in the world. In the world. Um, and we should be building on that. That's why we put the tech fund in place to take that forward. But it does require skills in there. Thank you for the question. Um, I think it's really important that we look around the world and see where we can get the best and, the, and also learn from them because not, all, not always the, the best, they've, they've had to tweak it, etc. So we can look at that and be able to analyse it and go, right, well, you know, we need to take the lessons learned. So we need to liaise with those people and to, you know, who've experienced it and we said, well, how best will that work for Jersey? And also bring that back. I totally agree it needs to then be adapted to Jersey and to how we are here, um, also because you know we're we're a small place, we're diverse, and so that needs to be adapted accordingly. And also to bring the skills here as well, so that we don't need to keep going back and forth. Um, I was really privileged to be able to be living in Brussels for, for 15 years, where I've been experiencing 
nationalities from all over the place where I've really had to study the 28 member states, now 27 member states of the, of the European Union. We had to know what was going on in each of those member states to be able to influence them. And so I really, I, I know um, the differences of how they've done things and I think it's been, uh, there's some great examples out there that we can um, build from. Thank you. I don't think we should just look at the UK. I think we're very lucky because some of our young people do go off and train in um, the States. They go off to Australia. They go off to New Zealand. And when they've been traveling, they're going to have picked things up, the best things that, of those islands, and then they can come and bring them back and, and we can utilize them here. So we just need to go forward. I think we do need more investment, definitely in education and investment in other areas of the island. But we've, you know, we've got a great chance now, and I'd really like to be part of a new government that can carry on and make improvements and be positive. Thank you. I think we need to bring back, back our pride in Jersey. I think we've lost a bit of it. We used to have two excellent industries, one which was hospitality and the other which was farming. And at the moment, uh, looking around at both of them, I think they are both doing extremely well in a very difficult environment. And I think environment is also an area where we could be in the forefront, not lagging behind, not taking other people's ideas, but having our own ideas. We've got young and very capable people here, and I think this is where we should be going. We need to be in the forefront, not taking things from other people, but going out there ourselves and getting them. Um. I think, yes, I agree. We need to cast our net wider. We need to look to other small jurisdictions. I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only one who's, who just despairs every time we hear the words, we should, the words, we should be world class, because we simply cannot be world class at everything. I think what we need to do is look to what we can do well. Um, I'd just come back from that. We need to have very good standards of healthcare. We need to have very good standards of education that fit our that fit our model, that fit our population. But I think we need to look to what we can do well, where we can innovate, where we can learn from other countries. That does mean actually going to other countries and talking to them. And to do that, we need to get over the idea that every time a government minister or politician gets on a plane, they're going off on a jolly. A lot of these are learning, are learning experiences and we need to support our politicians and, and people to do that, to travel and learn. Um, Concentrate what we can do well, whether that's sustainable farming, sustainable transport, tourism. Look at our strengths, play to our strengths and develop them. OK, I think we've come to the end of our time now. It's uh, half past eight, just gone half past eight. Um, I'm sure there's plenty of other questions people would like to ask, uh, but uh, I believe the candidates have done very well. I'd like to thank the candidates and also the questioners for their contribution this evening. And finally, thanks to all of you for coming along this evening, and uh, we look forward to seeing you on Wednesday the 22nd for the, for the voting. Thank you. <laughs>